in-depth conversation and for multiple years have tried to figure out a way that we could bring him into the B&H family and share his expertise, not only on the ocean, uh, not only in the deep woods of remote, fantastic areas of Alaska, uh, but an all around amazing photographer with commercial applications as well. Uh, so Dave, if you're in the room, love to have you go ahead and pop on the camera and uh, unmute and we can kind of jump in. There he is. How are you doing today, Dave? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing good. So for those of you that have stuck around from Jennifer's presentation, uh, we are doing the same format. We'll be running the live Q&A as well as the live chat. Uh, as they come in, I'll try to do a little bit better job of jumping on. To be completely honest with you, Jennifer and I intentionally did not share the images, so they were all new to me as well. So I was participating as I was hosting. So I'll do a little bit better job of dropping uh, into the questions as they come through. Um, but yeah, like I said, you know, Dave, we we met, we, we hit it off and had a very uh, kind of similar idea of the outdoors and conservation, the way that we view the world trying to find a way that fit to be able to express our, our overall uh, intents within photography. And I'll have to say, every time you show me new work and every time I see new imagery, your evolution and what you've been doing with uh, light in, in shooting in such an almost commercial applicable way um, and capturing and gathering wildlife that most people will never see in their lifetime, that you had the distinct pleasure of, how, how many years skippering a boat and being out in the wild? Uh, I've been a captain for about six years and I've been working on boats more or less for close to a decade with uh, some breaks in between and it's uh, unfortunately I haven't had a camera for the entire time uh, particularly five years in the Navy but mm -hmm. the rest of it's uh, kind of just improved over time and it's become that side hobby as a start that's turned into something that's become pretty much the dominant focus in my life so that's fantastic. Yeah. So we're going to jump right in since we're already five minutes past and I'll allow you to grab control of the screen and we can start with some images. Again, sure. this is going to be a really casual interactive experience for us. So as the images are going to come up, we're just going to have more of an interview style and conversation. Um, drop any questions you have in per image or anything that he has done up to that point and I will do my best to get them over to Dave. Um, Thank you so much for everyone that was on here with your uh, interactivity and engagement. It was fantastic. So feel free to join in as much this time. So go ahead. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. You are live and full screen. Beautiful image. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, John, when, when you and I met, um, I was running a adventure yachting company. So this is basically from that, but to start and kind of roll it back, um, I got, I got my start in the civilian side of, of uh, boat work, uh, working with Lindblad probably back in 2014 and uh, realized quite quickly that there's uh, some major perks and some downsides to being gone for, you know, six months at a time because you, you do get to capture a lot of those moments that you don't necessarily get every week. So, um, that's the uh, kind of something that's stuck with me since then. And now it's uh, always looking for an opportunity to, it, whether it's working for another company or when I had my own, just to be doing it and, and uh, having those experiences with, with other people, but also being able to do it for, you know, eight weeks at a minimum, um, just to be able to capture that one second in 16 weeks in some cases. Right. So, and is that off the, this is directly off of a, it looks like a larger boat because I don't believe you'd be able to get that many uh, dolphins in one image from a Zodiac. No, this is, uh, this is definitely off the, the front of the boat that we had, which was the uh, Pacific Provider, which was 160 feet. Wow, so. fantastic. And this is from a Lindblad trip, uh, which, I mean, I don't know how many, I know, a lot of people from Lindblad interact with B&H and uh, it's honestly, it's a great company that does operate all over the world in some pretty remarkable places. Um, I've only been able to experience it in uh, Mexico and Costa Rica and Alaska on the US boats. Gorgeous image. I love the, I love the play, you know, 
between being able to think of wildlife as the animals that we are seeing in there and also in the habitat and the landscape that they play to be able to tell a story. Uh, you know, one of the things I find the most amazing in speaking with you is sometimes understanding that an image shot from a Zodiac or a boat is going to look entirely different than when you go 15 feet into shore or you're actually onto a rocky coastline. Uh, so understanding and setting up a sense of place like this is fantastic. It is. I mean, it's, I, I think uh, for most people, you're always trying to look for that unique perspective or that unique, uh, I mean, even just the experience of, of doing it and having kind of that different story to tell behind every image. Um, and that's, that's what's been helpful, you know, from you brought up the commercial side, but when you go from, you know, doing it for other people to running your own company, doing it, and you need to, you know, be on a shoestring budget to create all the marketing content and things like that. Um, it really does become as much about storytelling as, as creating images that people can be drawn to or pick out of a crowd on a social media platform. So. Oh, wow. That's a fantastic play of, of mirroring for almost a, you know, I, I hate to do it, but Christopher Nolan's been on my mind so much. This is probably the third time in three different live sessions I've brought him up, but the, the fantastic things you can see on a glassy ocean. It is remarkable. And I think that's the only time I've ever had it. And, uh, you know, don't expect to have glassy water with dolphins on a regular basis, but that was another Lindblad uh, uh, during a six month contract down in the Sea of Cortez on the way up to Alaska. And it's, um, I mean, that's just what you get from going on those kind of trips is, is that, you know, very rare occasional experience. So you know, that, that's something I'd like to talk about because a question came in from Amber and before we dig in too deep, I'd kind of like to talk uh, about this image specifically and then lead into to Amber's question. But when we find ourselves as creators, image makers, storytellers, photographers, artists of whatever kind, a lot of times we have, I shouldn't speak for everyone of the audience. I have found that the preparation versus immaculate image is always a tough one for me. And to your point of, you know, being on, on the ocean for so many years, seeing different things to be in the middle of the ocean and see something that's glassy. I mean, it's something that is un amazing. And what advice would you give for the photographers that are on here that may have, if they're lucky, two opportunities in a year, you know, maybe even in a lifetime to see some of the areas that you have seen, how much of this is intuition, how much of this is taught through experience and how much is, of this is you just recognizing that you only have light for X amount of hours and you focus entirely on image gathering? That's a good question. It's also kind of a difficult one. I mean, it's, um, ha you know, I, I do have the experience from life of only having one or two opportunities. I mean, I, I almost consider that the last year uh, I've had zero opportunities to go out and do anything. Um, you know, for me, it's, especially on the wildlife front, it's a uh, pretty hit or miss. You, you know, you, you can have the greatest plan in the world, but it's always Murphy's law with actually getting to get that perfect shot or get the shot that you want. So I think, you know, it, in terms of actually capturing the images, it's 90% luck, 95% luck. And the rest of it in my mind is just being so comfortable with that gear ahead of the trip that you don't have to, you can capture the image in almost a knee jerk reaction instead of it being something where you're sitting there trying to figure out what your settings are and which lens you should have on for that particular time, you know, having that go to setup that's almost like an extension of yourself, which can sound kind of tacky, but uh, I think when you're doing it enough as most people tend to do in the photography space um, to be that comfortable with it, you can be ready for that split second. I think that's great advice. And it's one of the things that each of us B&H reps doing the shows that we've done for the longest amount of time and having the distinct opportunity and pleasure to meet some of the 
best living legends, some of the most uh, influential and creative, and some some people that aren't as well known but have a skill set is one of the common threads that we hear and that is is preached from wedding, wildlife, commercial, corporate headshots is making sure that prior to a trip you are so innately comfortable with that camera that you understand where the back focus button is or you understand where a quick menu is um, prior to getting into that situation. And um, I love that answer. I think that's fantastic is that at the core, you know, everyone should shoot a lot, shoot often and be prepared so that when you go in there, you're not paying for that trip to um, Alaska for 18 days with a brand new Canon Mark IV. <laughs> Canon, you know, get the, get the camera you've never shot with and you want the best possible images. It, it might be better to take the camera you're quite familiar with. Right. And, and shoot. I mean, I, 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 I agree with that entirely, but at the same rate, I learned the hard way having, you know, eased myself into photography and uh, buying, you know, not investing money correctly into my gear. So, you know, I've broken more lenses than I care to remember, but, you know, you buy that, that Canon, you know, 51.8, three or four times. It's like, I should have just bought the, the L series that's weatherized and been confident to take that out into the situation where I know that'll hold up better than, um, you know, something that's still made out of plastic. And especially with the travel and nature and wildlife stuff, you can't really predict what the weather's going to be like and you can get great shots out in the rain. So as long as you're comfortable and confident with it, it's, um, I mean, these things are built really solid across the board with all the brands. So it's, uh, there's, they're being set up in a way where you're also not feeling constrained by your gear or having any trepidation and taking it out to get that shot is pretty critical in my mind. Great. I love it. Wow. And that's, that's one of those opportunities that, I mean, I think I looked for the, that shot for four or five years and it was two seconds Mm -hmm. while cleaning salmon. (laughs) (laughs) I bet the camera smelled fantastic after you took that shot. (laughs) It still does. (laughs) Uh, And and where was this shot? Uh, That's in Southeast Alaska. So when I, when I left um, Lindblad, I ended up Jump, I worked for a conservation nonprofit travel company called, called the, uh, the Boat Company. And they're based in Southeast Alaska, uh, running trips back and forth from uh, Sitka to Juneau. And that's you know the, a smaller group of people, um, a little bit more on the fishing and hiking. And uh, they're a little bit more flexible just because they have half as many people. Mm, gotcha. So, um, that was, uh, and that kind of got me a little bit more involved in the conservation space moving forward. And also um, was kind of the inspiration for starting our own company. So. Beautiful image. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've, I've got to go into, and, and this is not, directed towards this image. However, this was perfectly, perfectly timed, Dave. Uh, Angela, if you're still on, uh, Angela just wrote me a thing as the end because I kept focusing on on animals that could kill you. And she said, John, speaking as a person who's going on a three-week photo trip looking for alligators and bears at the end of the month, you got to relax on the alpha predators. <laughs> they, really are inter- uh, they really aren't interested in us. So yes, this reminds me of the scariest movie I ever saw in my life, the 1978 movie Grizzly. And I know that you are safe and alive to talk to us, but oh, wow, that is an amazing image. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's a a comfort thing. Uh, In a lot of cases, it's, um, you know, they, they are very big and at first, I didn't realize how fast grizzly bears are. Uh, they're exceptionally fast. Um, but, you know, in terms of when they're out and about, I mean, there's times of year that they're not as much of an issue, uh, like during salmon season, as long as you're giving them their birth. It's, uh, and I, I've never had the, the luck of owning a, uh, a really long lens. So, 
most of the bear photos are always from 20 feet away, maybe. Uh, but you know, when you're out fly fishing or taking people fly fishing in Alaska, they're, uh, they're usually pretty mellow and focused on their own thing. So I don't, I don't have, I, I think honestly, the ones that scare me the most are the orcas, but you're not really in the water with them. Right. So, but, uh, just getting to interact with bears is, I mean, it's inexperience. And if you're going on a trip to Alaska, it's, uh, definitely one of the, the great things to get to be involved with. Oh, wow. So you, you got to tell me the story behind this one. This is, is unbelievably gorgeous and without a doubt, a unbelievable story behind it. Unfortunately, the story is not that great. It was, it was <laughs> one of those things where uh, we came across this uh, on a hike and I just, how often do you see a, a skull with moss growing over it and kind of the forest taking over? But it was, um, I mean, this is the epitome of Southeast Alaska in my mind. And, and you know, the Tongass National Forest is one of the, it's the biggest rainforest, temperate rainforest in North America. So, um, you know, it's, it's basically our Amazon up here and it's, this incredible place that uh, has kind of been the the focus for conservation, at least from the start for me, just because it is such a big diverse area and there's so much going on um, and such a healthy force that's seemingly constantly a risk. Mm -hmm. So this was just a happenstance opportunity on a trail out in the middle of nowhere uh, in Southeast Alaska, which is just a bunch of islands, but it just goes to show, I mean, you don't see a ton of deer in Alaska in the islands, but they're definitely there. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, always on the lookout for something, something unique and interesting that uh, isn't just a run of the mill photograph. You know, and th th this is a question I asked prior and, and I, I tend to have a lot of photographers I work with who are wildlife photographers, landscape photographers, and um, you know, conservation is at their core because they're spending so much time in areas that are being, you know, affected. When you are approaching any of these photography outings, are, are you approaching with a kind of a prefabricated story in your head of what you're hoping to get? Or are you just literally interacting and engaging on the photo shoot with your wildlife and then just picking elements that you feel could be put together as a story later to, to present to people? I think it's definitely the latter. Um, I think most of it is the kind of letting it all fall into place and, and just getting out there and having the story on that experience of being there uh, first and foremost and letting the pictures kind of happen as they happen because especially in, in nature, you can't really plan it. You're not in any sort of studio uh, where you have any control over anything, uh, especially light. So it's... Um, to me, it's been more about kind of having the story and then having it, I mean, not to sound like the person who wants to do the, uh, the slideshow, uh, like back in the day of your, your trip, but it's ultimately what it comes out to be. And you kind of build that story about the place off your experience and then uh, have the images to, to back it and catch people's attention. So. You know, and a, and a question came in as we were discussing, and, and it goes into regards <clears throat> to you getting that, you know, once in five years shot of the orcas. Is there a, a mindset that you have where you tend to have a preset camera uh, setting where you're going in understanding what you will be shooting? Or is this something where you're just quick on the draw through experience, making rapid fire adjustments from breaching whales compared to a, a bear eating a salmon, which would not require as much shutter speed. Um, are these things that, again, just throughout shooting have become se second nature and muscle memory to you? Or is there kind of a wildlife versus commercial shoot style that you have pre-set up? Uh, I mean, as it, when I started, it was almost entirely just an aperture priority all the time. And mm -hmm. I love shooting wide open for some reason, but uh, that, that was kind of where it began as it's progressed over time. Uh, I mean, I definitely leave things in a setting that I know will be 
at least you know freeze time and uh, and have decent enough light that it's not a, a max a massive amount of editing after the fact. Um, but sometimes I don't get the shot. I mean, it's that's half of the the challenge of being in the wildlife photography space. I have plenty of images that I wish I had gotten that I didn't. And I, I think over time, it's just a matter of figuring out what your system is to uh, to have it be as close to what you want to get as possible. Because right. most of these animals, most of these experiences, they're not going to hang around for you to get it right. So, um, you know, that being the case, having a decent amount of proficiency in, in Lightroom and Capture One are, uh, you know, very important to the space. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, I have so many, I, was, I think I was telling you the other day, you, you go on these trips and you go shoot photos at night and you set it on a two second timer delay so that it's not shaking because you're shooting it off a tripod and then that once in a lifetime moment happens and you push the shutter release and it's counting down for two seconds and you've completely missed it. So <laughs> it's uh, just, just having, you know, the comfort and also double checking and triple checking during the day to make sure that everything's on the, uh, the right, you know, at least what you're ready for. Um, right. That's super helpful. Wow. There's a couple non-wildlife photos in here too. Mm -hmm. uh, also in Alaska, this was a long time ago. It's just another one of those experiences that, I mean, if you've been to Alaska, you've probably flown in a small plane uh, if you've been there long enough. And it's, this was just one of those, uh, those moments where with my background having, you know, gotten into photography, I, I basically started uh, as a skydiver and was terrible at it. So it's been downhill from there, but it's always kind of looking for that, that moment and that experience that someone can look at and say, wow, and mm -hmm. ultimately want to frame for myself. Right. Oh, wow. That's, it looks like a painting. It doesn't even look like a photograph. This one's a little more edited, but uh, it's the same thing with being out in nature and around the animals, being, uh, being out on the water a lot. You get to kind of have these just experiences of what the ocean actually can be capable of. And that's... Uh, that's always been one of those things that never ceases to amaze me. And it's probably why I love being out there so much is that it's definitely a way to feel very small. You know, and it's, it's interesting that you bring this image up because, you know, I immediately look at this and I think of the last place I would want to be is on a boat photographing. And yet some of the best images have come out of inclement weather and speaking to what you're saying regarding being comfortable with your equipment and being prepared for inclement conditions to be as readily available as those bright days. Um, I have not been as lucky as you to be in Alaska as much as you have, but I have been to Alaska half a dozen times. And for those of you that are on the chat, I, I know that earlier we did have someone from England, which is another place where you can leave with shorts and a t-shirt and 15 minutes later it's raining on you. Um, I think this image kind of speaks to my feeling of, you know, the way that it was for us in Alaska where the seas change quickly, the skies roll over, and then an hour later it could be sunny again. Uh, so I, I think that does speak to the presence of, you know, being prepared um, for all situations if you're going to be doing wildlife and outdoor photography. Oh, we did have a question come in. Uh, how large was that wave? Uh, that one's probably about 40 feet. So not, not big. That's, that's easily, you know, body surfable. <laughs> uh, wait, I think it's the next one. About that big. Oh, wow. So the surf, wow. the surfboard's 10 feet long. So that's a, a good 
size reference. But same day. Mm -hmm. And are you on a, a skiff? Or are you on a boat of any kind? Or are you actually shooting a long lens from land with these? Oh, no, this is in the water, uh, either on a jet ski or in a water housing. Okay. Ideally on a jet ski. <laughs> it's still, well, it, it's, I mean, it's one of those things that's, that this is probably one of the few things that I'm really passionate about outside of the nature photography side of things is just the, the big wave uh, photography because it terrifies me. So you, we had a question come in, right? When you said that when you're doing this type of work, um, you know, what, what equipment are you using? Are you using underwater housing and, you know, fast speed bodies? Are you using mirrorless? Um, how, how is your setup? Is, is it individualized for I'm going to shoot surfing today and then tomorrow when I'm back on the boat, I'm going to take my housing off. If you could just speak to a little bit about how you build out your kit for what seems to be very, very much outdoor inclement weather uh, shooting. You seem to be almost prepared for everything. Uh, I do, but in a lot of these cases, it's it's uh, difficult to actually swap your gear out on the fly or change anything. Um, you know, for for this, I've never gotten to shoot big waves from a an actual boat. It's always been from a, a jet ski, which is not as stable of a platform to be shooting off of. Um, and then, you know, other than that in the water, but my, uh, my go-to for, for that's usually having, you know, a wide angle lens and, and something longer. I shoot a lot with a macro lens for um, portraits and landscapes and uh, the wildlife photos. I just never shoot them that close. It's, it's always more of like a portrait. So, um, you know, I, basically just invested in the, uh, the wide angle and the macro and the, uh, the ports for those, the a dome port for the, the wide angle and a, just a regular port for the, uh, the macro lens. So Angela popped back in and she said, she knows it's not really, uh, it may sound like an odd question. Excuse me. I read that wrong. Uh, I know this may sound like an odd question for Dave, but I lived in Alaska for quite a while. Everything up there is just so big. How do you handle the sense of scale? Ooh. That's a good question. Uh, I, I think it definitely makes you, when you're traveling on your own up there, you're definitely having to be a little bit more cognizant of your travel plans because it is easy to get kind of lost in that, you know, I want to go from here, point A to point B to point C to point D all in a matter of, you know, four days. And it's, uh, it doesn't seem like it's that far, but it usually is a lot further than one might think. And there's always so much going on up there just in terms of wildlife and the culture and the weather conditions that you have to be a little bit more ahead of the power curve on your planning just in terms of getting about, because it really is a, a massive place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're traveling there, I'd highly recommend picking a, a regional area and not trying to do the entire state in one, one trip because it's hard for people to go. We meet people all the time who'd, you know, be going on a trip in Southeast Alaska and then flying up to Anchorage and then going to Brooks Falls to photograph bears and they want to go see Denali. And I mean, you're basically traveling through like two thirds of the United States, mm -hmm. continental US size wise. And uh, it, it's just a great place to, to slow it down and take some time and try, if you can try to do it in a manner that's allowing you to take your time in all of the places instead of rushing through them just to get a, an image. Yeah. And you know, that's fantastic advice. I wish I would have spoken to you before my trips to Alaska, you know, and the other thing regarding scale um, I've noticed a lot, you are, you're getting a fantastic sense of place and yet you are, you're doing it in a way that you're framing the, the wildlife without it seeming like what I had a hard time with is I came back with thousands of pictures of caribou that were beautiful in the back of my screen. And then I put them into Lightroom and I was having to magnify <laughs> 30 times because I was so taken by Denali or I was so taken by this, you know, 77,000, you know, acre swamp that I just drove through. Um, do you have any advice for people that are going to shoot there? Um, 
regarding getting scale of the wildlife into the image, not just scale of traveling from point A to point B? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that everyone kind of always wants to get that really good close up image of, of a, uh, a bear or like you're saying, the caribou or the whales. But um, I mean, with Alaska, it really is about the setting for that as well, right? I mean, you could be shooting a, a bear in a zoo for all people know if it's up tight. But when you get that, um, you know, I, that's why I don't really like shooting the longest lenses if possible, because the more you can capture of that bear in a river or the, you know, the orca out in the middle of nowhere, there's not buildings behind it type of thing. It's, it's such a beautiful place that you can't really go wrong by having more background in it because it just opens it up. And I'm a big fan of having that negative space in the, the images anyways, as much as possible. So it's uh, to, to be able to get that. I mean, it, aesthetically that's always been more pleasing to me than just filling the, the whole center of a image with one thing. That's great advice. And, you know, I, I think the lesson that the great Jay Mazel said is, you know, I know it's difficult with grizzlies, but like you said, as long as you are with a good guide and you respect their, their girth and the time of year is it's better to shoot with your feet or excuse me, better to zoom with your feet than it is to zoom with the lens. Um, so I think you have done a fantastic job of that. Uh, w w one last comment on this image and we'll move on. But uh, Stuart said it looks like uh, the Eddie in Hawaii. That's, uh, that's actually not. That's uh, Todos Santos in Mexico off of uh, Ensenada. So just south of San Diego, a couple hours. Wow. So that was a fun one. I mean, we only had, uh, we got, basically had to take a two hour jet ski ride because the the port was closed and got out there and we were the only people there. So to make matters worse, we were kind of stuck with that whole uh, sitting in silence for the whole day instead of being able to root anybody on a little, <laughs> it's a little unnerving when you're by yourself out in the middle of nowhere. So. Well, speaking of scale, uh, that does a fantastic job to show a scale with a mountain range, a glacier, and this person diving off, and you realize that that boat is probably, what, not even a tenth the size of the glacier behind it? Probably not. I mean, I think it was about 18 feet from the, the water up to the, the tip of the bow. So. Wow. But, yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a great point uh, to, to try to capture, you know, something that's going on with uh, what's, you know, a, an awesome landscape photo by itself uh, from back further. It, uh, I mean, that's just one of those things where from a, from the commercial perspective, you want to, you know, put people into that, uh, that situation, make them feel like they're there and want to be there. And it's, uh, that's what we did every week. <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, it's a uh, it's a great play on the color of his board shorts to uh, the almost monotone uh, color scheme that you have going other ways. But, you know, you if you're not considering this wildlife for all of the attendees, I can tell you that I put my feet in the ocean in Alaska for approximately 10 seconds and regretted every second of it. Um, how on earth is he diving into there without a survival suit? Is that just literally in the water and right back up onto a Zodiac? Pretty much, yeah. Just the, the, the polar plunge. Uh, gotcha. Got to gotta go for it. Oh, it's funny. And, and a question just came in from Katie that says, you know, didn't the diver find the water too cold? So I, I guess we answered that. Yeah, it's the the intention of it being too cold and then right back into a, a, a Zodiac and into the warmth. Exactly. Wow. So I, I think that um, th this is one of those situations where it it really is uh, the light can be very difficult in places up north uh, at most times of the day because it is so light out. But um, you know I don't I don't really have an extensive workflow in editing, but just shadows and highlights for the most part, and uh, that's why you know I. 
having a, a decent laptop and hard drives to store your images on and uh, and some working knowledge on on Lightroom or, or Capture One is, uh, you know, all it really takes to make what could be a blown out photo up there uh, survivable in my mind. It's gorgeous. Well, coming from New York, I think that Otter is trying to tell me something. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Is that a, uh, is that a pup on its stomach or is that just somehow it's the way the fur is? That's just its hands. So they, they carry, uh, every otter carries a, a rock and they, uh, they use it to crack shells open for their food. But the, I mean, one of the things that you should be able to get on any boat trip in Alaska is otter photos because the sea grizzly is the, uh, probably one of the more prevalent species up there, especially on, on the ocean. But oh, they, can gorgeous. Pretty, they can be pretty skittish. So they're, they're definitely one of the ones for the people who are, are going on a trip up there. Um, be patient because there's always one that's a little curious that mm -hmm. will come closer. Wow. So what range are we looking at here? This is this is going actually perfect for the question on the uh, the scale of everything in Alaska. That's Mount St. Elias, and that's from ninety miles away with a with a hundred millimeter macro lens. So it's. Um, just in terms of the landscape up there, there's no wide angle in the world that can capture all of it and, and really do it justice because wow. it's too big. So I know that you have been there and Angela, who's on the thread, said that she is from there. I do not know how many of you have had the opportunity to visit Alaska, but, but for me, it really was the first time in my life I really understood the scale of our planet of being undeveloped. And a colleague of mine and I rented a, a F-250 and decided to drive from Fairbanks to Talkeetna to stay the night to go to Denali the next day. We thought it's no big deal, it looks easy on the map. Not understanding the terrain, the roads, you know, highway to a, a seriously off-roading adventure back to a highway. And one of the things that we kept doing was seeing this mountain that we thought we would eventually get to. And we didn't realize that as we were driving to your point of 90 miles away, it was a solid two hours before we even got anywhere close to thinking we were near the mountain and that had never happened in my life. So very well executed shot to convey that sense of scale because like you said, I tried to shoot panoramics and I just never could really, really execute on how open Alaska is. The, the panoramas are great though. It's, uh, I mean, it's, a nice thing to have in the, the back of your pocket for um, a lot of the landscape photography, especially up there where everything is so big. And it's obviously much easier with, uh, with editing software now than it would be otherwise. Wow. So this is a little, a little more on the, uh, just the boat life aspect of uh, my my usual way of trying to go shoot wildlife photography is working on any boat I can find myself on. Um, and this was not this past year, but uh, summer of 2019, um, ended up captaining this landing craft from the 1950s and delivering propane to some pretty remote uh, areas in Alaska, which we sailed from uh, Anacortes, Washington to Kodiak. And that thing was not fun to take across the Gulf of Alaska at all. But we had a, a question come in earlier, and I think that this is a great example because now I've seen two images that I'm guessing are drone shots, but I could be incorrect. But um, 
you know, how much equipment are you taking with you and how important is it to have a diversity of aerial to, you know, you, you've already answered the long lens. You don't have very many long lenses, but how much gear are you taking, especially when you're confined to these small planes to jump from city to city? Uh, about a backpack's worth, not, not a huge backpack, just, you know, like a Kelty or a Patagonia type backpack with a couple pockets to, to keep a, a laptop and a hard drive and a power source. And then camera and a couple lenses and the drones obviously been one of those things that I mean it's it's really I found it really nice to be able to get a different perspective on it because things can obviously look so much different from 20 feet above you or 100 feet above you than they can from the surface of the earth so it's um it's been probably one of the biggest game changers and probably the, the biggest uh or the the most used investment uh, with regards to photography gear I've ever had, just because it it does lend itself to something unique, and that's I think that's what it's always been about for me is trying to take a picture that is unique, that it won't be the same picture that twenty other people have taken. Right. But that's uh, the experience of uh, getting to Kodiak to shoot wildlife, we had to uh, fly these propane tanks off of the boat for three weeks straight. Wow. And this might have been the highlight of that. Uh, I mean, we we I did get to experience shooting bears and, and the wildlife in Kodiak, but this was probably while we did look for wildlife here, this was probably my uh, my highlight of that, which was going to, this is Latuya Bay, which is in uh, on the Gulf of Alaska, uh, closer to Juneau. So this is the Gulf of Alaska on the left side and the bay on the right. And for any history buffs out there, this place is famous for being the home of the largest wave in recorded history that uh, went up about 1,700 feet up the side of a mountain and then came down through the oh whole bay. <laughs> wow. So. That's beautiful. And that's another one with the uh, the drone, obviously, and uh, mm -hmm. stitched together with the panorama. But it's, um, you know, it, it's just taking the time to find the right right opportunity and uh, be ready for it. It's mm -hmm. so you know you've done a really good mix of sense of place as well as the animals. Are you finding? that you're shooting a lot of things like this insanely gorgeous shot in panoramic because you're not able to actually find the wildlife on a bad day? Or is this something that um, you just immediately knew that you wanted to do? Because I can tell you from experience, I've been to Denali three times. I saw every living creature that you are supposed to see in Denali the very first time within the third hour. And then the next two times I saw nothing but caribou and, you know, small mammals. Um, so, you know, you said it was, it was oftentimes the chances of seeing some of these exotic animals to, to most of us mainlanders and some people from other countries, you know, a good guide can help and going to a good spot can help. But are these things that you're doing in the interim while you're waiting or are these intentionally shot to supplement? Usually it's just something I'm doing while waiting around. Um, mm -hmm. but we're always on the move. So it's, uh, because there, there's always some sort of purpose or reason for being out there in the first place. It's to get from, get ourselves or some sort of service or people from one place to another. So, you know, seeing seeing the opportunity and and uh, having something that just catches your eye. I mean, it's not a. Uh, there's no right or wrong way or good or bad photographs in my mind. It's you know, if it catches your eye and it's something that you're going to remember for the rest of your life that's a great photograph, whether it is to someone else or not. 
So it's, um, you know, it's, we're basically just documenting either the places or our own stories uh, on our travels or even at home. So it's, uh, you know, that's just one of those things that it's definitely a lot of it, you, you know, you come across things when you go out looking for something else and uh, that can end up being better than, than the thing that you were purposely going out looking for. Yeah. And that's, that's great advice. Um, for those of you who are attendees uh, currently on here, um, there's a photographer by the name of Seth Resnick and um, he does a lot of Antarctic tours. And one of the key things that he spoke about was this image right here, the moments in between, as opposed to being wasted, photographing to see what could develop and what could create. And oftentimes to the orca shot, sometimes when you're shooting a landscape, you're the one on top of the boat while it's raining that gets the shot that no one else saw. So I love the fact that you included these in. It's, it's an absolutely stunning shot. Thank you. And it looks like everyone agrees. They're saying the same thing. <laughs> um, so this is a, uh, a Highland cow in Alaska at about midnight, which was uh, a, a random occurrence but that, that's just one of those things we're having when we when we got to Alaska I ended up staying on the last trip for about six more weeks and uh working out of the port there so we had a vehicle and this was just from a an afternoon off and uh into the evening of driving out into town and that's one of those situations where having your camera with you all the time uh can pay off even though a lot of the time it doesn't very much. It's absolutely beautiful. That that lighting is so ethereal and it's it's such a romantic image of just this random cow looking at you like why are you on my road at midnight? <laughs> the ethereal lighting of a Ford pickup truck. <laughs> <laughs> I agree well, though. It's it's uh it, it is good to have that I mean, this is one of those situations, though, where you were talking about, you know, being set up and ready to go. It's I knew I wanted to get this image because I probably would never see a cow like that in Alaska again. But mm -hmm. it's pretty difficult to, uh, you know, nail the settings right away. So I definitely in the minds of many probably cheated and had this in aperture priority. You know, at the end of the day, when the shot comes in, I don't believe there's cheating. The one and only Ansel Adams spent more time in a dark room than he did shooting, and he would have been called a cheater in his contemporary. So I think this image speaks volumes. And when we begin to ask questions of how versus why, we find ourselves oftentimes in waters that we should really not be treading. Um, I like for that. everyone that's, that, that's on the call, the one thing I will say, and, and Dave hit the nail on the head with this, um, a lot of times we can become too bogged down in gear and equipment. And one of the best bits of knowledge that I have learned from every photographer that we've spoken with, including Jen on the last call and a lot of people is improvisation and, and being able to gather an image that you know has legs is more important than maybe I don't have my strobe. I'm not going to take the image. I don't have my speed light. I'm not going to take the image. Um, this looks as good as a pro photo B1 to me as I've ever seen. And it's a Ford F-150's headlights. So that's fantastic image with great intention executed well, not worrying terribly about what he did not have. Another bear wow. photo in Kodiak. He looks very confused. I think his eyes were uh, going two different directions. This bear, <laughs> but this wow. was one of the, this is one of the uh, harder experiences of of having a false charge bear and bear spray. Mm -hmm. So, wow. And this is also in in southern Alaska. No, so this is on Kodiak Island which is uh, home to the larger grizzly bears. 
but definitely a place that uh, should be able, to, if you're visiting Alaska and you're seriously looking for grizzly bears, this is, uh, that's probably one of the, the better places along with Southeast Alaska. And then obviously Katmai, which I've never been to, but. Wow. That's gorgeous. Take a lot of fire photos for some reason. I can't explain it. I think it's just that it might just be my favorite thing to do. So, it's, uh, well, it's beautiful. It's a extremely well composed shot, and the colors are are gorgeous. I feel as a wildlife photographer and as a action shooter, I think is the same mentality that's drawn towards a a primordial sense. And fire is primordial, and I will never ever show my images after seeing this one, but I've taken hundreds of campfire photos as well. It's uh, there's something, you know, magical and is brought in. And of course, you know, that, that setup with the moon above is it's creating all kinds of FOMO for me. Don't stop taking them, John. It's the <laughs> we need more, we need more campfires out there. <laughs> Oh, wow. So uh, I think to, to keep things uh, kind of new and fun for me, because it, it is, I, I think, one of the challenges of being out for long periods of time or doing the longer extended trips is it can get kind of um, routine in some cases. I mean, you're obviously looking for that that one special moment, but it's quite easy to kind of get into a lull in in photography, I think everyone gets there at some point. Um, so I've kind of been working on shifting over to uh, trying to shoot wildlife on medium format, which has been challenging in its own way. Still have to be close because no one really makes a long medium format lens. But well, it's beautiful. There we go. Wow. And I think that's the thing is, you know, it's, it's obviously, you know, everyone has these dreams of doing Africa and doing, you know, Alaska and places like that. But in a lot of instances, especially as we've seen in the last year where, I mean, I was supposed to go work on a boat last summer and the hospitality industry, as everyone knows, was shut down. So there's still, you know, things that are in reach if you're passionate about getting better at wildlife photography. I mean, if, if you're in the U.S., there's definitely places in driving range that can deliver. We had a, a fantastic conversation regarding that at Optic of last year. If any of you attendees were, were part of that, and Christy Odom, who is known for her wildlife photography that will also be later on in the week, um, like all of us, was stuck in her backyard and began to shoot wildlife with macros. And it created an entire splinter in her evolution as a photographer. So to that point, Dave, I think that's that's great advice. If you live in Florida, you know, to drive to Alaska is as almost as much of a pipe dream as, as for me to fly to Africa. However, each region of, our, of the United States has so much diversity within wildlife it's the, the largest spread of any other continent, the North American continent, including Canada and going through the deserts and the high plains. Um, so that's great advice to get out and find something. There's gonna be some form of local wildlife that are still just as impressive. Absolutely. Wow. Where was this taken? That was in Yellowstone uh, last winter. So once again, I mean, one of those places where it, it does get crowded and there, there's no shortage of people shooting images there, but um, there's just so many opportunities to kind of, this was actually next to another group of people. And, you know, it's, it's just looking for that different angle 
uh, and and kind of capturing that whole background versus just the the animal, which you know in some cases you're just forced to do with the gear you have. It's almost like that was queued up with what I was saying is I never would have imagined this being a beautiful wildlife uh, photograph after growing up with my grandfather having a farm. And yet <laughs> you have done a fantastic, uh, fantastic capture um, with that. Did you guys have donkeys growing up? I did not have donkeys. My, my, I grew up in Florida and the suburbs by the ocean, but my entire family in the mountains of North Carolina all had farms. And it seems that almost everyone that owns a farm in North Carolina puts a donkey in with their cows or their horses. And so I grew up with a lot of loud donkeys. Wow. So I had a question come in as, as you were going through some of these images towards the end, you know, Maybe you could speak a little bit about your use of macro when you were shooting wildlife. You, you touched a little bit on the, you know, the utilitarian uses of certain lenses and however you have throughout your career kind of been stuck with certain lenses because it was either the only thing you could afford at the time where you just happened to be packing in a certain way. Have you done a lot of wildlife shooting with macro? And if so, you know, I'd love to hear reasons why or, or how that turned out. Yeah, I, I have done, um, it's kind of my preference actually, because I can, I can get the focus really sharp on one particular spot that seems to be the focus range is a little bit tighter on a macro lens. So, you know, I can get hyper-focused with that from 10 or 15 feet away or 40 feet away even. And uh, I just, I like the end result from that lens better. I mean, these, go back a couple but that's shot on a macro lens um, 120 millimeter macro lens the uh the same with the others and it's i think that it's one of those things where you step away from it or you're looking at it on your computer after the fact and you can zoom in and you still have you know uh an image of the subject that's as tight as if you focused only on that with a longer lens and uh, from further back. So you get, you get this really interesting result for, you know, portraiture that you wouldn't necessarily walk into thinking from a macro lens. I mean, when I first was looking at it, I, I kind of associated it with taking pictures of bees on flowers and, you know, trying to get the hummingbird. And it is a little bit slower on the focusing, but the, the results typically do come out fantastic. Well, that's great. And you, you had brought it up earlier and there was a question and I guess I just misunderstood the, the use of the lens. So thank you for sharing that with us. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stop your sharing because we are at the hour. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, thank you for the engagement. David, it was fantastic having you on. I'm so happy we finally got you to be able to participate in one of the events. And I, Look forward to doing many more with you. Uh, if any of you are interested in reaching out, we do have Dave's information on our website and throughout the blast that we did at Davy Jones through Instagram. And if there's anything else that you'd like to throw out, I know that you said that there was an NFP that you were working with. If you'd like to send anybody over to them, I'm happy for you to drop it in the last uh, couple of seconds that we have into the chat. Um, and then we can wrap up with that. Yeah, thanks for having me, John. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'll be on here to answer any questions. We're All right. Sure. Well, thank you, everyone. I am so happy that we wrapped up day one on a positive note with some amazing imagery. Um, it is always your voice and your ability to tell your story. Uh, Dave did a great example of that, countering from Jennifer's side of, of almost having some intimate, compassionate pieces. And Dave has brought his aesthetic. So however you shoot, shoot continue to shoot. And remember that the more you shoot, the more 
you directly connect with your camera. So the less we have to think about the mechanical and we can get into the inspirational. I look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow. Feel free to shoot us over any questions uh, on the chat before we go. And otherwise I will um, let you know. Oh, I'm so sorry, right at the end. Uh, Jennifer and Dave's social will be on the note that was sent out as well as on the wildlife week at b &H. Thank you all and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thanks, Sean.